we began looking at the next stanza of Psalm 119 last Sunday in verses 129 through 136, thinking about the psalmist's resolve to obey the Lord. And in particular, last week we noticed the first four verses of this section of the psalm in which the psalmist makes it clear that the reason he obeys is God is wonderful. And now we come to the final section of this stanza, the last four verses, beginning at verse 133 and going through verse 136. And we see the sort of other side of the psalmist's motivation to obey. In the first four verses, he says he is motivated to obey. The reason for his obedience is he has come to know and understand who God is and how God is, and what God does, and who he is, and therefore he obeys because he wants more of God. But as we look at the final four verses of the stanza, what we see is the psalmist saying, not only do I obey because I want more of God and I understand who God is, but now I obey because I also understand what sin is and I want none of it. Tobacco. Asbestos, lead paint, what do all of these have in common? At various points, they were very commonplace in history, inexpensive, and in some situations even celebrated for what they were seen to accomplish. But today, all three are known as carcinogens. Cancer-causing agents that, if utilized, produce death. When you think about sin and the world around you, How many people are walking around making use of spiritual carcinogens? Just imagine trying to go back in time when tobacco was celebrated and even recommended in doctor's offices. Or when asbestos was the new product on the market that was inexpensive and effective for its intended use. And everybody was using it and trying to reason with the people in those periods of time and saying, you don't need to use this product. About how far might you get? You might just be laughed off. You might even be attacked verbally or physically. And now think about sin. It's almost says in these verses, and we're going to look at them now. I not only obey because you are a wonderful God, but because I see that sin is terrible. Sin is terrible. Let's read the entire stanza, and then we will place our focus on these final four verses. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep my steps steady according to your promise, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant. And teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. What I see here and what I hope that we can see together as the psalmist closes this stanza is that sin is terrible. And he sees the terrible nature of sin in two aspects. He sees the terrible nature of sin in verses 133 and 134 in seeing that sin oppresses. Sin is oppressive. And then in verses 135 and 136, he sees that sin is not only oppressive, but sin separates. It is divisive. It separates people 
from God. And because it is oppressive and it is divisive, it is terrible. And because it is oppressive and divisive and terrible, the psalmist wants nothing to do with it. He wants to obey God. And you see this first in verse 133. I think that the English Standard Version misses the mark a little bit in its translation of verse 133. Actually, the New King James Version does much better. It says, Keep, direct my steps by your word. Now, the English Standard Version says, according to. But it is the idea, keep my steps by your word. Keep my steps by keeping your word is really the thought that is presented. Direct my steps. Of course, this is imagery that the psalmist has been using from the very opening of the psalm. Remember that when you open Psalm 119, it talks about how blessed is the way of those who keep the Lord's word. That is, those who walk, this is that metaphor that we used all last year in our theme uh, for last year, Colossians 2.6, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. That is, so live according to who he is and the example he has given you. And the psalmist says here, direct my steps. That is, show me how to live. How? What does the psalmist say? By your word. We are not directionless. We have not been left to wander aimlessly. But God has given us signposts for this life. And the psalmist says, direct my steps by your word. Help me walk in the way that you would have me walk. Help me live according to the way that you would have me live. And the reason for that is in the latter part of the verse. Because he says, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Let not one single sin have power over me. Have you prayed that prayer? Let not one single sin have power over me. We have all been in a place at some point in time, and we may be there this morning, that sin has power over us. Even the Apostle Paul experienced it. He says in Romans 7 verse 24, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? Wretched man that I am. The Bible is very plain about the nature of sin. Sin is a cruel taskmaster. You've heard it said that it will take you farther than you want to go. The Bible makes it very clear. There are a number of New Testament passages that speak of it. Jesus says in John 8, verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And then Paul says it also in Romans 6, verse 6, We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And then Peter says it in 2 Peter chapter 2. He's warning the Christians there against false teachers who have crept into the congregation. And he says in verse 19, they promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption for whatever overcomes a person. To that he is enslaved. Now you see, is that the way we really look at sin? We look at sin sometimes like we can dabble in it. And for a moment we might be harmed, but it's temporary harm and it comes with some pleasure. But the Bible says no. You can't play with sin. You can't play with sin because as soon as you give yourself to sin, sin takes all of you. It enslaves you. And it will rule over you as a cruel taskmaster. And so the psalmist says, direct my steps by your word because I don't want even one sin to have power over me because I understand Sin is oppressive. And he continues on that thought in verse 134 when he says, Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. The oppression of sin is expressed in the actions of wicked people. 
And again, we find a common theme that has been presented throughout the psalm, and that is the actions of the psalmist persecutors. Now, we do not know his exact setting, but we know that those who are persecuting him are trying to keep him from serving the one true God. And he recognizes it, and he asks God to redeem him. Now, this is very similar to the request that we saw in the previous stanza in verse 122. Give your servant a pledge of good, more literally translated, be a pledge of good for me. He is asking God to ransom him from the oppression of sin, in this case, at the hand of sinful people. But the reason that he asked for this is so that he might see, so that he might see God's word. Two thoughts here on these first two verses. The only way to avoid the sinking sand of sin is to entrust your life to the Word of God. I remember some years ago now, and I hesitated to say this, but I think it's always good to highlight good in the congregation. Sid was leading a prayer, I think on a Wednesday night, and he made a statement, help us Apply our lives to your word. Now that's not the way that we usually say that. We usually say, help us apply your word to our lives. But I like the thought, help us apply our lives to your word. The word is the standard. God has set the pattern for our lives in his word. Our desire is not to take little pieces of the word and insert them into our lives. Our desire, if we are God's people, is to apply our lives to the pattern that he has already revealed. Amen? The only way to avoid the sinking sand of sin is to entrust your life to the word of God. But then also see, in verse 134, sin not only in our lives, but also in the lives of others will always try to suffocate obedience. Now that's something we need to ponder on for a moment. If there is anything in your life, anything in your life that is causing you to stumble, that is laying temptation before you, then you need to be very clear about what that represents in that moment. It is nothing Sin in our lives and the lives of others will always try to suffocate obedience. The psalmist wanted to obey God because he did not want the oppression of sin. Second of all, see in verses 135 and 136 that he recognizes that sin not only oppresses, but it separates. Verse 135, he makes the request, Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. Now, Philip read for us from Numbers chapter 6, beginning at verse 22, what has been called the Aaronic blessing. Aaronic, that of Aaron. It was given to Aaron to pronounce over the people of God as his people, as the people whom he had chosen and to whom he gave his covenant and his faithfulness. And he says, the Lord will shine upon and here the psalmist says, make your face shine upon me. He is seeking God's acceptance and approval. And of course, the opposite of that acceptance and approval is separation. That God would turn his face away. And the psalmist does not want anything to separate him from God. He wants God to look upon him and accept him, and approve of him, and he wants God, the latter part of verse 135, to teach him. This, as we have mentioned in the past, is the single most repeated request in Psalm 119. Teach me. Teach me. Teach me. Teach me. Do we grow tired of hearing it? How often have we ourselves prayed it? Because it was the supreme request of the psalmist. Teach 
What is the answer? What is the answer to our sin problem? We already admitted in our brief overview of verses 133 and 134 that all of us at some point have been under the influence of sin. What is the answer to our sin problem? Well, living in the Christian age, of course, the very first word from our mouths ought to be the name of our Savior, Jesus. Jesus is the answer to our sin problem. He is the answer to our sin problem. And if we were given a thousand years, and for every moment of those thousand years, every waking thought and word from our mouths was thanksgiving and praise of God for what He has done for us and in us and through us in Jesus Christ, it would not be enough to thank Him for the answer to our sin that we find in Jesus. Okay. Are we awake? Now, having said all of that, and without in any way doing anything to undermine that, with the understanding that Jesus' life and death takes away our sins, we add, it does not stop us from sinning. That we still have our freedom of choice. And so, like the psalmist, even equipped with the gifts that we have from Jesus Christ, it must be our prayer each. Because if we are to be taught of God, and that certainly for us includes being taught of His Son and the life that He lived and the example that He gave and the sacrifice that He made, if we are taught of God, then we can begin to battle against sin. Because Paul says that the Word is our sword. And that faith is our shield. And so the psalmist's request, teach me, shows us one of the most practical ways that God kills sin in us. And it is through the word that he has given us. And if you feel the influence of sin in your life, the very first thing that I can tell you, if you are already a Christian, and if you are not, is get in the word. And let the word do its work. In you. And it will bring you to a place where sin no longer has power over you. And so the psalmist prays, teach me, teach me, teach me. Verse 136, he closes the stanza a bit differently than the way he closes the previous stanza. When you look back in the previous stanza, there is what we might call righteous indignation in verse 128, where the psalmist says, I hate every false way. But here in verse 136, there is a genuine sorrow and grief and mourning over sin and its consequences, in particular in this case, in the lives of others. The psalmist has great pity and compassion over the sins of those around him. And he joins men like Jeremiah who wept bitterly. Jeremiah, who was given frequent messages of the destruction of God's people because of their utter wickedness and refusal to repent, and yet Jeremiah still weeps. Lamentations 1.16 For these things I weep. He's viewing the destruction of Jerusalem. My eyes flow with tears for the enemy has prevailed. Well, Jeremiah knew. He knew the reason that the armies of Babylon were marching on Jerusalem, and he himself had suffered. He had suffered under the hand of his compatriots who refused to accept the word of the Lord and imprisoned him and put him in the bottom of a pit and who wanted his head because he was declaring that what they were doing was sinful, and yet he could look at the consequences of their sin, and he could still genuinely weep. His eyes flowed with tears because of the consequences of the sin of those around him. And likewise, the psalmist, the psalmist is weeping because of the consequences of sin in the lives of those around him. When we see that sin causes division, 
that it creates separation between God and men, we will know over sin. And not just our own sins, but also the lives of those around us. Can you imagine anything worse than separation from God? This past week, Jessica was driving in Lexington, and she sent me a text. She had seen a bumper sticker, and it was joking about hell. She said, how could anybody joke about hell? And I said, well, they probably don't really believe in hell. But what is hell really? You know, we have the images of uh, a fire and smoke that go up forever and the, the smell of sulfur where the worm does not die. But what is hell really? But eternal separation from God. What is the psalmist weeping over here in these verses? The understanding that sin separates people from God. That either his face is shining upon you or his face is turned away from you. Do we weep over the knowledge that the people around us are walking in darkness? That God's face is not shining upon us? Has it broken our hearts? Have those broken hearts led us in compassion to bring them to life and to truth. Greek philosopher Plato wrote a massive work known as the Republic. He was, as I said, a philosopher, and this is a work of philosophy, but perhaps the most well known portion of that entire work is Plato's what's been called Allegory of the Cave. And in the allegory of the cave, Plato gives a scenario in which there are people who are enslaved in a cave. They're chained to a wall, and they cannot turn their focus anywhere but on the wall directly in front of them. And on that wall are displayed shadow puppets. Behind them, they do not know it, are puppeteers. And a light source in the form of a fire. And Plato is imagining this scenario for the purpose of teaching the importance of philosophers coming down to the common man and explaining the importance of philosophy. But I think that there is an application for us as well. He goes on to imagine what would happen if someone inside the cave who had only ever known the cave as their reality somehow got free from that cave. That if they were to see the puppets, they would not even begin to really understand those puppets. And if they were to look into the light source of the fire, they would be overwhelmed and, and they would not be able to see anything because their reality so long had been in the dim light on the other side of the wall. But he says, even then imagine a step further that if possibly the person who was released was able to make it up to the surface. And stand in the light of the sun and how disorienting that might be. But then imagine that in the face of all of that, somehow that person began to embrace the true reality around him. What if he were to go back into the cave and try to tell his former fellow prisoners about the real world that existed outside? They would think it's crazy. Did not slowly and to extend the truth. And I think about here a world that now relishes in sin, that calls sin good and righteousness bad, and how we might begin to explain to people the real life that we have seen and can only be seen in Jesus Christ revealed in this book and how we might do that without sounding crazy. And yet at the same time know that if we don't, we're leading people in a shadowy realm 
three thoughts here as we close. Number one, does sin have power over you today? I really uh, like this thought from a preacher from a bygone century, Charles Bridges. He says, forget not that every sinful indulgence is, for the moment, putting the scepter into the hands of our worst enemies. When we, as Christians in particular, give in to temptation, we are yielding what belongs to God to our very worst enemies. And perhaps that understanding, just as it aided the psalmist in his resolve to obey God, will help us as well. That when we think of giving in to temptation as giving power to our worst enemy, that we can take a step back and allow the scepter to remain in the hands of the one alone who deserves it, God, who is Lord of our life. But of course, that's only true if we have obeyed the gospel. If we have turned from sin, believing that Jesus is Christ, and confessed him as Lord and Master, and died with him, as Paul mentions there in Romans chapter 6, being buried in water, participating in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that God puts to death sin in us, and we come up a new creature. And God is king in our hearts. And as he is king in our hearts, then we continue to allow him to reign on the throne in our life. When we turn away from it. Second of all, we ask first, what rules in your life? Second of all, we ask, does the word direct your life? Does the word direct your life when no one is looking? Is the word your map to live in? Does the word direct your life when the world around you is going in another direction? Does the world direct your life when what it says challenges you and makes you uncomfortable? Does the word direct your life when obeying it is hard? Does the word direct your life. You alone know the answer. But if you can identify in this moment that the word is not directing your step, the only time to change your step, the only time to get back on that path is today. And then finally we ask, not only are you weeping over the sin in your own life and in the lives of others, but has that very real grief caused you to share the life of Jesus Christ with your neighbor? And if not, what are you going to do about it? Think about these things.